This week, as you can see in the handout, um, we're going to be talking about the Holy Ghost. Now, I, one thing that I regret is that we didn't cover some basic fundamentals of uh, the Holy Ghost in section one. Um, I think that they are going to do that. Matt is going to include that. Uh, Matt and Doug, as they are teaching, uh, some of the curriculum that, that we went through was made for me. Some of it I, I put in myself. And, and we're, as I said a dozen times, maybe more, that we're building this as we go. So some of the things I've had to go through and then realize we should have done something different uh, in the beginning. So uh, we're not going to spend a lot of time on the fundamentals in here because we're going to assume that most everybody in here knows the basics of who the Holy Spirit is. Now we're going to hit it a minute or two just to give you scripture references, if you will. Um, and if you need to know more or, or dig in deeper, touch base with me after class, we'll, we'll talk more and go deeper if you want. Um, but we're trying to continue on in the thoughts that we've had and, and we're trying to progressively make the next step each week is, is how my mind works on this process. So as we've talked about uh, a number of different things uh, and, and last week uh, we talked about what it means to as we were saved and, and talked about salvation in section one. Last week we, we kind of rehashed some of that and going further with our salvation. We are to be separated from our sinful ways and our sinful life. And that we are to uh, continually strive to grow, grow and draw closer to God. Therefore, drawing further away from that sinful nature and that sinful life that, that monopolized everything that we did when we were not saved. And we'll try to monopolize what we do after we're saved if we will let it. Uh, and so as we dealt with that last week... Um, Brother Max, it was funny, uh, Brother Max came up to me after class and said, how come you didn't mention the Holy Ghost during that? And I told him, I said, Brother Max, that's a good point. We're going to hit it next week. Uh, because we're, we're going to go through this and, and you're going to see that some of my lessons are, are now, as I mentioned to you last week, they're not going to be as detailed on paper because I'm wanting you to dig in. I'm wanting you to study more. I'm wanting you to, to search, search through the scriptures yourself as well. Um, I'm going to tell you, we're going to not wait to the end to do a review like we did in section one. We're going to do somewhat a review in a couple of weeks from now. So I want you to be digging in. I want you to be studying. I want you to be proactive, not waiting till the review times to figure out that we didn't, we didn't uh, study enough. Uh, go ahead and be looking ahead. I want you to dig deeper, especially on the Holy Ghost, because it is absolutely essential for the walk of Christ for us to be filled with the Holy Spirit. Uh, we cannot walk as we should with Christ. We can't be holy as we should if we don't have the Holy Spirit in our lives. Now, the, let, let me address this up front. A lot of people from outside of, of our denomination, let me word it that way because there may be other people in our denomination, but I know People outside of our denomination have gotten the impression, or maybe they've been told outright and it was told wrongly, that we believe if you don't have the Holy Ghost or if you're not baptized in the Holy Ghost, you can't be saved and go to heaven. That's not what we believe. We believe that you get saved, then you get filled with the Holy Ghost, and then you go on to walk out your life with Christ. But we don't believe that if you don't get baptized in the Holy Ghost and, and all that, you're not going to heaven. That's not what we believe. We just do believe that once you are saved, you are to get filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's some of the fundamentals that I, I debated, I wrestled with on whether or not to put in here. That there is a, a, a second work of God of an infilling an in, and a baptism of the Holy Ghost. And, and again, if you want us to deal with that, we can deal with it outside of class. And, and I'll share scripture references and, and uh, we're going to hit a one or two scripture references today, but not focusing on that point. But, but salvation comes first, then the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Uh, and, and it's not that you have to have the baptism to make it to heaven or to, to get in. Now, uh, I will word it this way. You're going to have a hard time being strong enough to make it if you don't have the Holy Ghost. Amen. 
You understand? So, so I, I'm not telling you that if you don't get baptized in the Holy Ghost, God's not going to let you in the gates. That's, 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 that's not what we believe. Uh, but we do believe if you're going to walk out a life of holiness, if you're going to live a Christian life, a Christ-like life, you're going to have to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You're going to have to, because you're going to need that strength. We don't have it within ourselves to be like Christ on our own. Uh, we get born again, and then we get filled with the Holy Spirit, which is the power to live that life of Christ. Okay. So, uh, let's just dive right into the first section here. It's, it's very elementary. We're going to hit it, and we're going to move on. I just want you to have the Scripture references, if nothing else. I, I debated on leaving it, even leaving it out. Uh, because, you know, on down is the more important part for today. But I just want you to have these if you need them or, or want to have them, because I think that's one of our challenges as Christians. We know the Bible says things, but we can't always remember where. So if we have these, we can always go back, read them, make them a part of who we are and what we think. And we can pull them up later when we need them. Who is the Holy Ghost? He's the third person of the Godhead. OK, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. That's what Matthew 28 talks about. There are a number of scripture scripture references that reference the Holy Spirit. Uh, he was there at creation. Uh, he's there at the end and he's there all throughout. And, and I could have put a ton in there. Uh, but again, that's not the subject of what we're debating here today or not debating that we're discussing here today. But uh, we, we need to realize that the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Godhead. He is not an it. He is a person. He, and, and person is, I hesitate to even use that word because that's kind of a human thing. Uh, and he's not human. But uh, he, he is a he. It's, it's not an it. We don't need to refer to it uh, like that. So you understand that. Now, now, don't get me wrong. I'm not trying to get on a technicality here to make sure you never say the Holy Spirit because the Bible refers to the Holy Spirit. But we just need to be conscious in our minds and make sure we don't just refer to him as some mystical something another. Uh, he is the third person of the Godhead, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. The Bible even says in John 14 and 28, he is the comforter. Jesus says, I'm going to send the comforter uh, to you. And that's important for us to know that there are things that he's going to help us with. And sometimes going through our struggles, we need to know that he is the comforter. And, and I've asked God, please, Lord, send your sweet, wonderful Holy Ghost to give me comfort because I need it today. Uh, you know, because I, I've just watched. God send the spirit to touch me and, and, and comfort me. And I, there's days I've needed it and I asked for it. <coughs> Excuse me. The Bible says in John 16 and 13, he will guide you into all truths. If, if you are struggling to know the truth of something, you need the Holy Spirit's help to, to show you that, to explain that, to, to help you understand so that's what the Holy Spirit is going to do. If you are baptized in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit's going to check you. He's going to keep you uh, on the right path if you will stay sensitive to him. He's not going to let you veer too far off without checking you. Now, after he checks you and convicts you, if you've wandered on off on your own, you can do that. But I'm telling you that the Holy Spirit's going to try to keep you in the paths of truth. He's going to lead you to Christ every time. He's going to lead you to Christ. In this day and age, I think that's critical to know, too, because I see a lot of folks that are tagging the Holy Spirit as being a part of things that he's not a part of. So I don't want to get into that. I'll leave it alone. <clears throat> so we need to understand that if we're going to be Christ like, if we're going to live this life of Christ and if we piggyback off of last week's lesson, if we're going to push away the sinfulness and the sinful acts that, that have been a part of our lives prior to salvation. And as we get into this walk of Christ, the way that we're going to do that is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. We're going to have to, to, to be filled. We're going to have to stay filled. We're going to have to get refilled. We're going to have to continually go to God asking him to continue to fill us with the Holy Spirit. It's not that that we need to be filled because we've done this or that. It's just, it's, it's the life that we live. We, we burn it up using it, living off of it, so to speak. And we need for more of it, more of him to be a part of our lives. You see, I, I couch myself 
saying it. I didn't mean it that way. I, I'm just saying that's what we got to be conscious of not to do. Uh, but w- we have to seek God for a filling, a, a, a refilling over and over again. Um, I, I heard a preacher say, I think everybody should pray every morning until they be filled afresh and anew with that Holy Spirit before they ever face the day. He said, if you do that, you'll have a, that devil will have a hard time with you every single day. But we don't do that. <laughs> Now, I I want you to understand that I'm presenting it this way because our denomination, I won't speak for others, our denomination subtly, not directly, but very subtly teaches us that you get baptized in the Holy Ghost and then you're it. You're good. You're done. You don't have to worry about it anymore. Now, that's not spelled out in any doctrine, but we push you to get saved, sanctified, and filled with the Holy Ghost, and then we push you no more to be refilled. We push you no more to stay full. We push you no more to seek God for more of the Holy Spirit. And that's wrong. Because we should be refilled. We should continually be filled. When you're feeling weak, it's because you need a refilling. If, you, if you're running out of strength, it's because you need a, a new filling of the Holy Spirit. More of the life of Christ living in you, being filled in you again. And so... We must uh, uh, be filled with the Spirit. Now, let, let's look at it this way. Christ, the Son of the, uh, the living God, was filled. If you'll turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 3, verse 13. Like I told you before, I'm going to try not to put all the Scriptures in here so that we'll get used to Looking them up ourselves. Matthew chapter 3, beginning at verse 13. Then cometh Jesus from Galilee to Jordan unto John to be baptized of him. But John forbade him, saying, I have need to be baptized of thee, and comest thou to me? And Jesus answering said unto him, Suffer it to be so now, for thus it becometh us to fulfill all righteousness. Then he suffered him. And Jesus, when he was baptized, went up straightway out of the water, and lo, the heavens were opened unto him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and lighting upon him. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Continue on. Now remember, we put chapter and verse in there. This is one continuous thing. So let's pretend like four and all that's not there. So let's go back 17. And lo, a voice from heaven saying, This is my beloved Son, in whom I am well pleased. Then Jesus was led up of the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now, if you, if you want to reference this, if you look over in Luke chapter 4, it says, Then Jesus, being filled with the Holy Ghost, was led into the wilderness. So if, if God sent His Son on this earth and, and filled Him with the Holy Ghost, and that's how he lived his life, then we must understand we must have the same experience. We must have that same Holy Spirit filling us that we might be overcomers too. We will not overcome this world, the temptations, the distractions, the pressures, the the, the battle itself. We will not overcome any of it if we're not filled with the Holy Ghost. If we don't stay filled with the Holy Ghost. It's not just a one-time thing we get and then expect to live off, live off of it the rest of our lives. Um, the apostles were commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit as well. So it wasn't just Jesus, but his apostles also. If you'll turn to Luke 24 and 49. Luke 24 and 49. So Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost. He lived his life. He overcame everything that the devil threw at him because he was filled by the Holy Ghost. And and when he's getting ready to, to, to leave his disciples and followers and the apostles, this is what he said. Verse 49. And behold, I send the promise of my Father upon you, but tarry ye in the city of Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. He told them, don't leave Jerusalem. You wait 
until you receive the promise, until you be filled with this power of the Holy Spirit, don't you go anywhere without it. He told them up front, I don't want you to go out and try to do the things that I've commanded you. Now, he'd been commanded them and telling them what to do and how to live, making disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost, all of these kind of things. He told them all these things to do, but he left them with these words. But tarry ye in Jerusalem until you be endued with power from on high. I'm going to send the promise. Now, the, 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 if he didn't link it with that, the promise of the Father Maybe we could misunderstand what he's saying, that he's just going to give us some kind of power. But he's linking it to the promise of the Father, which is the Holy Spirit. Tarry ye in Jerusalem until you be filled with this Holy Spirit. So Jesus was full of the Holy Ghost. We see his apostles being filled with the Holy Ghost. And we move on down and turn to Acts chapter 19. We see the apostles expecting it to the next generation of Christians, so to speak. He expects them to be filled with the Holy Ghost as well. Acts chapter 19, beginning with verse 1. See, you guys beat me to it. Y'all's pages quit turning before I got there. Acts chapter 19, verse 1. And it came to pass that while Apollos was at Corinth, <clears throat> Paul, having passed through the upper coast, came to Ephesus, and finding certain disciples, he said unto them, Have ye received the Holy Ghost since ye believed? And they said unto him, We have not so much as heard whether there be any Holy Ghost. And he said unto them, Unto what then were ye baptized? And they said, Unto John's baptism, meaning the baptism of water. And, and then, then said Paul, John verily baptized with the baptism of repentance, saying unto the people that they should believe on him, which should come after him, that is, on Christ Jesus. And when they had heard this, they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. And when Paul had laid his hands upon him, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. So he's urging them that there's more to this life than just getting saved. You, you, we want you to be baptized in the Holy Spirit too. There's much more to this life of Christ than what you've got since you've gotten saved. We want you to go on further. Which, this scripture here, because there's a debate out there, and I don't want to get too deep in it, and, and, and you know what? I'm not going to get into it. I'll leave it alone. <laughs> Read that. That's, that. There's some other information in there about if, if the Holy Spirit is, if there's a second filling or if it comes all at one time, whatever. Um, but we see Jesus being filled with the Holy Ghost. He expected his apostles to be filled with the Holy Ghost. He told them, don't leave Jerusalem until you are filled because he knew the struggles they were going to face. He knew the, the challenges, the, the, the oppression, the, the, the pressure that the enemy was going to send against them. All of the struggles that they were going to face, the persecution, the, the, the torment, the torture, all of the things they were going to face, he knew that. And he told them, don't leave Jerusalem until you be filled with the Holy Ghost. So then we see Paul finding new believers and saying, have you been filled with the Holy Ghost? He didn't try to expound some great, deep and theological uh, explanation of, of, of life and what else they're going to do. He asked them, have you been filled with the Holy Ghost? Because he knew that the, the life of Christ in us, the Holy Spirit, is what's going to keep us. He's the, he's the, the seal on our lives of the promise. That's what the Bible says. We're going to be able to continue on because we have the Holy Ghost in our lives. And Paul knew that. He didn't want these new believers to stop there. Go on. We need you to be filled with the Holy Ghost. So we see him carrying it, as I said before, to the next generation of Christians. He's expecting them to be filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, this is very important because I do think that our denomination, back when I was young, they didn't let you get in this church and stay very long before they started asking, you've you, you been filled with the Holy Ghost yet? You've been baptized in the Holy Ghost yet? No, I haven't. Well, you need to start praying for it, brother. You, you need to start praying for it. You, you, you need to go down to the altar and we'll pray. And when I was young, if you went to the altar praying for the Holy Ghost, people came down to pray with you. We prayed until you got it. Now, that, that, I understand that for, for folks that's never experienced I understand that for people that have experienced it, it can be a, a, a scary uh, kind of thought to think these people might not let me get up from here until I get the Holy Ghost. 
But I'm telling you right now, there's nothing scary about that. That's people that want you to meet this God in a, in a better way, so to speak. I, I, I won't say meet him, but, but, but experience the fullness of God. Experience a deeper walk. And they're willing to pay the price with you. That's a church who believed we're going to pray through with you. We're not going to just leave you out there by yourselves. We're going to escort you into the throne room of God if we have to, to get what you need. That's, a, that's another lesson that we're going to talk about later on, but we've lost that. We don't do that anymore. We let people pray by themselves. We, we, don't, we don't fight the battle for anybody anymore, and nobody gets filled with the Holy Ghost anymore, it seems, comparatively speaking. And, and we, don't, we don't urge people to get filled with the Holy Ghost anymore. We don't tell them what, that's the thing to do. I remember this, this wonderful preacher that I listen to a lot. I, I've given tapes and CDs to other people. He talked about it. he went on in a revival and got saved. He'd come down to the altar the next night and he said another guy came over trying to get him saved because he didn't know him. He said the pastor evangelist, I don't remember which, knew he had gotten saved the night, the night before. So he told the young man, I'll take care of this and you go ahead on with another guy and pray with him. He said, w what are you down here for? He said, the Holy Ghost. That's what he asked me. What are you down here for the Holy Ghost? He said, what's that? He said, I didn't know what the Holy Ghost was. He said, the man told him real quick. He said, that's next. That's what you need. You need to get the Holy Ghost. So he began to pray in that moment. He said, it took him a while to get there. But he told, he said, told me the best the theology I needed to hear. What's the Holy Ghost? He said, that's next. That's what it is. And we need to readapt our thinking to thinking and telling the new believers, when you get saved, the next step is to try to be filled with the Holy Ghost. It's, it's an expectation to move on from just getting in the door and getting saved. If you're going to go out and have to face this world tomorrow, you need the Holy Ghost to do that. You're, you're going to fall apart. The devil's going to distract you. The devil's going to try to trick you. He's going to do everything he can. You need the Holy Ghost to be able to make it through that. I'm not trying to teach a Pentecostal, run in the back of the pews, all this that, that's that's not even a part of the discussion i'm trying to explain to you this holy ghost came from god to strengthen us to comfort us and we need to be filled with it we don't have to get caught up in the calisthenics of what that looks like today and and if we need to is there anything that god could do to you that you wouldn't like no no I mean, don't get me wrong. If he leads me into a fiery furnace, I'm not going to appreciate that. I understand that. I, I, I'm not trying to make light of that. But I'm just saying, whatever God's got, whatever he wants to do with me, let's do it. I want what you got, Lord, whatever that is. Speaking in tongues, whatever, I want the Holy Ghost because it is what's next. And we need to make sure that we're expecting that. We're looking at the new believers saying, have you got that yet? We're looking at the people that's been in the church for 20 years. If you ain't got it, then you need to get it. It doesn't make any difference. It's what we need to live this life of Christ. If you're going to make it at all, you're going to need this life of Christ living in you. It's got to be the source of what you draw strength from. It's not an external thing. I remember when I got filled with the Holy Ghost. I got saved on a Thursday afternoon. And I remember God felt wonderful. It was great. It was, it was a joyous time. I'd sought God. I'd wanted to be saved a long time. And some of you have heard my testimony. But when I got saved, it was a new life. But when I got filled with the Holy Ghost, this wonderful God that saved my soul, all of a sudden he felt right here with me. It felt different. I'm, I'm, salvation, I can't describe how wonderful it was. But the Holy Ghost, when I got filled with the Holy Ghost... I felt like this great, big, wonderful God. I remember having the conscious thought, who he's close. He's real close. You know, I, I didn't know of a better way to describe it than that. Is there anything that you can that you can possibly imagine facing that God can't help you through? That God can't give you the strength to overcome? We have a Bible slap full of people that faced Ten times worse things than what we've faced. And the, 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 the God that we serve helped them through that. We need the Holy Spirit to help us through that as well. God so ordained and so orchestrated things that, that we have a privilege in the New Testament that they didn't have in the Old. This God that's been with you is now going to be in you. And that is the filling of the Holy Ghost. 
So that's what we need. So we see Christ. He had it. He was filled with it. We see the, the, we see the, 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 the apostles. They were filled with the Holy Spirit. We see them carrying it to the next generation and them being filled with it. But the biggest... Or, or, what's that? Yeah, go ahead. He did. <laughs> uh, but the bigger point is, honestly, I should be able to start with this one, but we don't read it that way. Ephesians 5, verse 18. It is in your paperwork. You don't have to go to it. I, I put this one in here. It says, And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Now, how many of you think, this is a rhetorical question, how many of you think that this is a suggestion? A very direct statement. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be filled with the Spirit. Now, because it comes on the heels of be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, I, maybe that's what subconsciously softens the command of God to us and we think it's just a good idea or something to obtain to one day later on. But God gives us a very clear answer and a very clear directive. Be filled with the Spirit. Now, if you link that with all of the other places where he talks about pray in the Spirit, walk in the Spirit, live in the Spirit, do everything in the Spirit, then you understand he's telling you a, a, a very real command. Be filled with the Spirit. In everything that you're going to be facing, be filled with the Spirit. I think that the wording there is, is even critical because it, he, he's talking about be filled. Continually be filled. Every time that you're facing something, be filled with the Holy Spirit. Not just one time, not just happened back years ago when I was a kid. I, I got filled with the Holy Ghost and, and now it's, you know, whatever. It's a be filled. It's a continuation. Constantly be filled with the Holy Spirit. So we get down to the last section here. We must be baptized in and also walk full of the Holy Ghost to be an overcomer. I left out a letter there. <clears throat> we, I want you to turn to the book of Acts, in the book of Acts to chapter 4, verse 24. Now, I want you to understand something. We are Church of God, Pentecostal people. And so if you've been in Church of God, you've at some point heard us talk about Acts chapter 2, where the day of Pentecost came into effect, the spirit fell, and, and the church began, so to speak, living the life of Christ. People began to get added to the church that day. Uh, it, it was a wonderful uh, day for the church. It was the wonderful. It was a wonderful day because the Spirit came down and filled every one of them, and they became witnesses instantly uh, uh, for for Christ. It was a wonderful day, and that is the day that we Pentecostals point to as a very wonderful day because that was the first infilling baptism of the Holy Ghost. So we have these disciples and apostles, all of these believers of Christ who were in 120 of them in the upper room, and they were filled with the Holy Ghost. Now, they began to face persecution and struggle. Um, they had already been filled, but let's go to Acts chapter 4, verse 24. And when they had heard that, they lifted up their voice to God with one accord and said, Lord, thou art God, which has made heaven and earth and the sea and all that in them is, who by the mouth of thy servant David has said, Why did the heathen rage and the people imagine vain things? The kings of the earth stood up, and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his Christ. For of a truth against the holy child Jesus, and thou hast anointed both Herod and Pontius Pilate with the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were gathered together. For to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. And now, Lord, behold their threatenings and grant unto thy servants that with all signs and wonders may be, may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. 
excuse me, I skipped one, that with all boldness they may speak the word. By stretching forth thy hand to heal, and the signs and wonders may be done by the name of the holy child Jesus. Now, this is the critical scripture. I had you read the other, but I'm leading up to this one. And when they had prayed, the place was shaken where they were assembled together, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost, and they spake the word of God with boldness. So, this is the, the summation, if you will, the picture of what we're talking about. These people had followed Christ. A number of them had followed Christ. They, they, they uh, followed him all the way, so to speak, to the cross. I know they, they kind of dispersed at that point. But they, they continued to follow him all the way through the day of Pentecost when the Holy Ghost and the baptism was fallen on them. They began to preach the word of God and they found themselves facing persecution in a way they had not before. They were dealing with the, the they hadn't dealt with it indirectly. They had watched Christ deal with it. But nobody had ever pulled them into council specifically and say, don't preach this name of Jesus anymore. The Bible says it threatened them. Obviously telling them, we're going to do something to you, whether it be lock you up, beat you, whatever. They probably did all of that. Told them they were going to do this, and they found themselves at a crossroad. Peter even says, should we follow you or should we obey God? Is ultimately what Peter said. They find themselves at a crossroad facing the challenges of the enemy. And what do we see them doing? Praying and asking for God to give them strength. What does God do in answer to that prayer? He fills them again with the Holy Ghost. The struggle that they were facing. The, 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 the problems that, that were um, weighing heavy on them. And their prayer was, we just want to be able to speak with boldness. He didn't ask them, God, give us the Holy Ghost so these people won't bother us. He didn't say, God, can you straighten out these rulers? Can you get them off our backs? Can you get them to leave us alone? They said, God, can you give us the strength to speak boldly in spite of everything we're going to face? And God gave them a Holy Ghost. Now, they were already filled. If, if it was just a one-time thing, why were they filled again? Because God was answering their prayer for strength giving them a boldness to deal with the situation that they needed to deal with. They come together in one accord, prayed together. They, they, they bared one another's burdens, if you will. They came in, in one accord and prayed that God would give them the strength to overcome this challenging enemy. And he answered them by filling them afresh and anew with the Holy Ghost again. Everything that you're going to face, if you're going to overcome it, it will be if God gives you the spirit, the strength in the spirit to do so. These other scriptures support that. We must learn to walk in the spirit to be able to overcome the temptations of the enemy. If you want to turn to Galatians 5 real quick, we can see what those say. Uh, This I say then, uh, verse chapter, I mean, uh, Galatians 5, verse 16. This I say then, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary one to the other. So that ye cannot do the things that ye would. But if you be led of the spirit, ye are not under the law. And he goes on to talks about the works of the flesh. It, he's telling you. Walk in the spirit and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So the obvious uh, deduction is if you don't walk in the spirit, you will fulfill the lust of the flesh. You will give in to these things. So go on down to verse 25. If we live in the spirit, let us also walk in the spirit. So he's telling us not just to now understand something. He's giving us a word called walk in the spirit that it, 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 we have to apply that to our lives. We think. A lot of times that doing something in the spirit, we Pentecostals, let me say it that way. Not everybody's, you know, from a Pentecostal background, but the, the church of God's attitude is if we're going to do it in the spirit, we got to do it speaking in tongues or something. 
That's, that's not what this is talking about. It's a life uh, of God living through you, being full of the Holy Spirit, walking in it every day. So, so you're not just trying to get where you can walk around speaking in tongues, where you can walk around in some sort of outward demonstration uh, of, of the Holy Spirit moving on you in some kind of weird way. That's not what this is talking about. This is a feeling being full of the life of Christ and being able to walk every step of your life in accordance to the will of God by the strength of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit giving you that strength. The Spirit giving you the ability to do everything that you're doing. Every situation. It's not just a church thing. It's not just a prayer closet thing. It's just not an occasional thing. It's being constantly full of the Holy Ghost to be able to live this life of Christ. It's, you're going to have to be full when you get to the job. You're going to have to be full when you get home and have to face the family. You're going to have to be full when you're on the side of the road and your tires, broke, uh, your tires blew out and your cars broke down. It's being full of the Holy Ghost, full of God all the time. So as much as you can seek God and get filled and refilled, that's the answer. Let's go ahead and read Romans 8. 1 through 8. <clears throat> we must walk in the Spirit. Alright, Romans 8, verse 1. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. For what the law could not do, in that it was weak through the flesh, God sending His Son, His own Son, in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin, condemned sin in the flesh. Pay attention here. That the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For they that... I'll wait a minute. Let me, let, me, let me read that again. Now he's talking about what, this, what the law could not do in the flesh. And it says right here, that the righteousness of the law might be, may be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. He's telling you that righteousness that you couldn't obtain through the law, you can live a life of righteousness if you walk in the Spirit. It will be fulfilled in us if we walk in the Spirit. You will not fulfill it if you walk in the flesh. We've got thousands of years of Old Testament history to prove that. We couldn't become righteous if we wanted to. But the Spirit gives us the strength to live a righteous life. Not a perfect life. We've talked about that last week. You're not going to be perfect. But you're not going to obtain righteousness and live it without the Holy Spirit living through you. The, the, the law couldn't produce righteousness in you. But the Holy Spirit can produce righteousness in you. If you walk according to the Spirit. Contrary, uh, opposite, if you walk in the flesh, you can't. For they, verse 5, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For to be carnally minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So that they that are in the flesh cannot please God. We can't please God in our flesh. We have to do it by a walk in the Spirit. A continual filling of the Holy Ghost in every situation. You're never going to rid your life of the sinful things without the life of Christ living through you, giving you the ability to do that. If you can look in your life, I want you to hear this especially. If you can look in your life and find the areas that you're not an overcomer in, you need to seek God that He would give you the strength in the Spirit to be overcomers of each and every situation. There are things, there are things in our lives that we have not overcome yet, and we have to do it by the life of Christ. Being filled with the life of Christ for each and every situation that we face. Everything that you deal with, you can be an overcomer if you do it in the Spirit. Amen. Any thoughts or questions? I'm running us to the time. Yes, sir. Uh, are you saying, uh, Jamie, continually is used a lot? Are we as a continuous battle then constantly? We're either in the flesh or we're in the Spirit? Yes. You know, yes. like right now I'm sitting here 
Uh, I would like to think I'm in the spirit right now, but when I go out down the road, if I get mad at somebody going down the road, then I got out of the spirit, so I'm not, I'm not hopping back and forth. What, what am I, what's happening here? Just a constant daily battle? I, I think it is a, a little bit of a battle because Paul says, I die daily. You know, so it's a moment by moment choice that's presented to you. Are you going to react in the spirit? Or are you going to react in your carnal way? So if you find yourself weak, you'll react in a carnal way. You, you'll flip out the way you used to. That's when you say, okay, thermometer says I'm sick. Apparently this is a symptom, a sign showing I'm not doing what I'm supposed to. I did what I wasn't supposed to today. So God, not only do I need to ask you to forgive me for the act I did, I need you to forgive me also because of this, the, the being carnally minded. I, I was in the wrong mindset to start with. It was more than just a sinful act I did. I was wrong before that. So forgive me for that too. And, and then we pray and get filled again so that we can have the strength to make the right choice. So that maybe later on down the road when the guy cuts us off again, praise the Lord and bless you, brother, and we move on. You understand what I'm saying? But it's a constant struggle. We have to die daily. And, and we're constantly presented with the choice. Choose the carnal, choose the spirit. The Bible just talked about they war against each other all the time. It's so a moment by moment. We have to choose to live the life of Christ and if we find ourselves weak and too weak to make the right choice, we need to go back for more strength. So, so that, that alone eliminates the idea that all I got to do is pray once in the morning and I'm covered for the day. You may find yourself weak by lunchtime. What do you do? Wait till tomorrow morning? You better not. I've done it. I, I'm, I'm being honest. I've done it plenty of times. Find myself in a lot of trouble by midnight or whatever. You understand what I'm saying? We'll get ourselves in trouble trying to, trying to live our lives on without the life of Christ, without the strength to make the right choice.